Lord Jesus this morning. Amen. Let me greet you this morning. Greetings to the Ecclesia. Greetings to the Echonoia. Oh, you niemand praat met my even ogen nie. Greetings, let me start over. Greetings to the Ecclesia. Amen. Greetings to the Echonoia. Amen. Greetings to the called out ones. Amen. Greetings to the ones who has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Greetings to the church of the firstborn from the dead. Amen. Greetings to the church who is registered in heaven. Greetings to the church where the spirits of just men are made perfect. Amen. Greetings to the Israel of God. Amen. Come on, greetings to the redeemed of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord shout amen. amen. Greetings to the church who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrote righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Greetings to the church of whom the world is not worthy of. Amen. Greetings to brothers and sisters who trade together. Yes, my boy is still in the Baptist Kirk for more. Come on, you gotta, you gotta speak to me. If you don't speak to me, I'm going to speak to you. Amen? Amen. Let me just uh, say by way of introduction that this morning it's my honor and my privilege to share the word of the Lord with you. And that I am so encouraged to see how God is moving amongst us. Maybe some of you don't know, but God is moving amongst us. Amen? Amen. The Bible says it is God. Who works all things together for his good pleasure. Amen? Amen. And so I'm excited to see how God is moving. The atmosphere is filled with an anticipation. The atmosphere is filled with an anticipation to, uh, 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 that we are on the brink of a mighty, mighty move of God. I'm just going to speak to myself also. I'll just say it as I wrote it. In the season, I believe that there's a, for those that wants to, that there's a deepness in God that is calling out to the deepness in people. Amen. Only for those that want it. This is not for everybody. This is only for those that want it. They, they, are, they that are spiritually alive and discerning in the season are recognizing that there's a level of urgency with which the season must be approached with. Yeah, hear me good, hear me good. Those that are spiritually discerning are recognizing that there's a level of urgency with which the season that we find ourselves in now has to be approached with. While some is recognizing the urgency, there is at the same time, I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, a greater level of apathy that has come on some believers because they are spiritually not discerning. And, and you can sense that even in the atmosphere here this morning, that there's a, there's a level of apathy. Uh, what is apathy? Thank you for asking, Pastor. It's a very good question. Uh, apathy is a sense of, it doesn't matter. I am indifferent towards what is happening. I don't care. It's just one of those things. I'm just going through the motions. It is apathy. In this season, I believe that, that what is required again for believers is a baptism of fire. A baptism of fire. We need the fire of the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm just going to speak to myself because you're not speaking with me this morning. But we need the fire of the Holy Ghost. Uh, 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 it, it was John in Luke chapter number 3 that said the following. He said, I baptize you with water, but one is coming after me who is greater than I am, whose shoelaces I am not worthy to tie. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and in fire. I am not talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost because you have the Holy Ghost. I am talking about the baptism of fire. Ezekiel says that his word is like fire that is stuck in my bones. We need the fire of God that is locked up in your bones to start coming out of your bones and out of your mouth. To start coming out of your mouth and start manifesting in your circle of influence. To start manifesting in your family. We need the fire of the Holy Ghost. You see, it is the fire that destroys the chaff. It is the fire that burns away the dross from the silver. It is the fire that cleans the unclean thing. I pray this morning that the fire of God will find you. Amen. Amen. Oh, schat my 
So I said that, all of that, that was my introduction. Amen. I've got about a half an hour before pastor comes, so I'm going to try and take my time and work this thing a little bit. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bible, real quickly, let's look at um, Luke chapter number 9, verse 1 and 2, first finger. Luke chapter number 9, verse 23 and till 27, second finger. Luke chapter number 9, verse 57 to 62, third finger. And then if we have time, we'll throw in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 8. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you're looking for it, say wait for me. If you can't find it, say somebody, please pray for me. Luke chapter number 9, verse 1 and 2 says the following. Then he called these 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all devils. Over what? What did he do? So, Christ gave his disciples power, not just power, and authority over all devils. So who is this uncircumcised devil that's standing in front of you if you have power and authority over him? I'm not talking about that this morning. And to cure diseases. Verse 2. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God. That's very important. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God. And to heal the sick. Verse 23. And he said unto them, if a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. When? Amen. Let him take up his cross daily. And do what? And follow me. And he said unto them, if a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall do what? Shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall what? What a dichotomy. If you want to find your life, you must lose it. If you want to lose your life, you will find life. Yeah, you're not with me. It's going to get good in a minute. For what is a man advantaged if he gains the whole world and lose himself? Or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they do what? Till they do what? Now you got to talk to me this morning. This must be a Baptist church. He told they do what? This must know who comes on screens yet so that we can interact. Amen? Amen. Verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went into the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Does that not sound like us? Listen to his response. He said to them, and Jesus said to them, Foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nest, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their own dead. But thou go and preach the kingdom of God. Ooh, the he said to another, follow me. And he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Let me first go bury my mother. Let me first just take care of my brother quickly. Let me first just tend to the needs of my sister. You know, let me call it my goodness eight sort, man. Before I think he got four, you know. You know, the kids has to sleep early at night and tomorrow is a school night and niemand praat met my for ogen. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and you preach the kingdom of God. And another said unto him, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go bid them farewell, which is at my house. Let me go net yester eight party, man. Dan gaan ik hier het doen. Let ik yester go net um my life enjoy, man. Let me just first be a young person first and enjoy my youth. Let ik net yester my kinders go net groot maak. Let ik go net yester my career uh, tot by die plek kry wat ik voel het moet wees, and then I will follow you. And Jesus said unto him, No man. Having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit 
for the kingdom of God. No man, having put his hands to the plow and looking back, his foot. So the kingdom has a foot. Amen? Amen. The kingdom has a foot, Lizzo. No man, having put his hands to the plow, is fit for the kingdom of God. We are continue speaking to you this morning as you would have gathered on the topic of discipleship. As we have been doing for the last three weeks. This morning I want to speak to you, if I can title my sermon, I would title it, The Power of a Shared Life. The Power of a Shared Life. Um, if you go to first finger, you would note that Jesus says, after he has called the disciples, he, say, he sent them forth, after he has given words of them power and authority, he sent them forth, known to, to go and preach the message of the kingdom of God. And so the first question I want to ask you this morning is, what is the, what is the main point about discipleship? When we talk about discipleship, what, what is the point? What is the main point? Why disciple people? And so, Many people say, well, when we disciple people, we disciple them so that they can become more like Jesus. Yes, amen, yes, no, right? Well, that's accurate, but it's not complete. You see, the model for discipleship is Jesus. But we don't disciple people to be more like Jesus. We disciple people so they can have a closer relationship with the Father. Jesus' model of discipleship was to point the apostles not towards himself, but towards the Father. And this is a, this is a key thing that we must, we must switch in our understanding. The model is Jesus, but the aim is the Father. So when we determine how we ought to live our life, when we determine how we ought to disciple, when we determine how we ought to do what we do on a daily basis, we point towards Jesus as a case study. But the objective is not Jesus. The objective is for sons and daughters to be raised in the Father's kingdom and to have a closer relationship with the Father. Because Jesus did not come to call you towards himself. Jesus came to reconcile us with the Father. And so we put so much emphasis on Jesus, who is our Savior, that we forget that we are actually supposed to look upon the Father. I know I'm messing with some of you this morning, but um, stay with me. You see, the model of discipleship is Jesus, and we see this in his life. We see that Jesus walked with his disciples, which was not just the 12 apostles. The 12 apostles were not the only disciples. There was the 72, and there was also the 120 that was in the upper room. So there was never only 12 disciples. <laughs> there was never just the 12 disciples. There was the 72 there was also the 120, and then there was a whole host of other people, the 5,000 that was fed with the fishes and the bread. There was thousands of people that walked after Jesus. And so when we sometimes think about disciples, we think to our apostles. But you see, Jesus showed us a pattern of discipleship. And that pattern was that he took three years of his life, and he shared his life with them. They were with him, day in, day out, Virgil. Fidria. And so when we talk about the model of discipleship, the model of discipleship has to be sharing your life. Because that's Jesus' model. I'm, I'm running ahead, about, ahead of me. You must then begin to understand then that discipleship is about the Father and the Father's kingdom. We see in Luke chapter number 9 verse 1 and 2 that the scripture indicates that Jesus gave the disciples power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God. We have to then very importantly distinguish between witnessing and discipling. We, we have to make that distinguishing. Is that right? Bankers, Engelse, Major, PA, English. 
We, we have to then distinguish. There, there has to be a distinguishing between witnessing and discipleship. We want to disciple, but we don't want to witness. While others again, they witness, but they don't disciple. There's a difference between the two. Discipling is not witnessing, and witnessing is not discipling. Are you still with me? Praat met me asjeblief, as het eina is, as kreed sy eina, dan weet ek ook as eina, as het amen is, as kreed sy amen, amen. Just to say something, you know, as preachers, we're very temperamental, we, we have to feel that you, you know, if I don't, it's just, it's just one of those things. So a lot of people don't know that, understand the difference between witnessing and discipling. Witnessing is before someone comes to Christ. Before someone accepts the completed work of Christ on the cross for his propitiation so that he can be reconciled with the Father. That's when you witness to someone. So in other words, you're trying to let that person know that you must become born again. But once the person becomes born again, now we disciple them. But the question then becomes, what do we disciple them into? Right? Right? Because a lot of us, we are discipling people, but we don't know what we are discipling them into. Thank you, Lynn, for a year, man. I appreciate it. Say over here. Amen. I, I want to make a statement which may sound controversial, but it is not controversial. It, it goes like the following. Many of us, many of our understanding is that we disciple people so that they can become mature in their relationship with Christ. You know Christ has never came so that you can have a relationship with him. Christ never came for you to have a relationship with him and your owner. Christ came to reconcile you with the Father so that you can have a relationship with the Father. still in the kerk van And so and so we we disciple people to become mature in Christ because Christ is the model. Christ is only the model. But Christ never came so that you can have a relationship with him. Christ came so that you can be reconciled with the Father. That, that is why he came. That's why he died on the cross because Isaiah says your sins and your iniquity has become likened unto a wall between you and your God and has hid his face from you so that you cannot see him. So when we were in sin and iniquity, we did not have access to the Father. We could not see him. But the Bible says when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, there was silence at Calvary, but there was a big sound in the temple. The sound in the temple was the veil that separated the holy from the most holy place that was torn. And for the first time in history, people now had direct access to the presence of God. It was not the presence of Christ. It was the presence of the Father. So when Christ died, you now immediately had access access to the father and everything that the father has and so we have to then understand that when we disciple people we don't disciple them to be more like Christ we use Christ as the model for discipleship but we disciple them so that they can go closer to the father so that they can become a son and a daughter in the father's kingdom you see, Christ taught his disciples to know the Father and to live in the kingdom of the Father. This is the point of discipleship. The point of discipleship is not to have a better relationship with Christ. Christ did not point towards himself. He pointed towards the Father. In fact, Christ lived for the will of the Father. Whenever you read the Gospels, you see Christ saying, I, I only do what the Father has sent me. He would, he would walk past somebody and not heal the one and heal the other one because the father didn't say heal that one. He, 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 he comes to the garden of Gethsemane right before he has to die. He prays to the father. He says, 
Father, if it is in your will, remove this cup from me, but not my will. Let your will be done. Christ's model was to show us and to teach us that it is possible in the earth for you to live a life that is in total obedience to the will of the Father for your life. And this is discipleship. Christ shows us what it means to be a son in the kingdom. Christ showed us what it means to be committed to the will of the Father. This, brothers and sisters, is the point of discipleship. The point of disciples, the point is to disciple people into the kingdom of God and help them grow in their obedience to the Father. Christ's methodology for discipleship was not a 30-minute teaching once a week. A house visitation every three months. A WhatsApp message and a phone call every now and then. His methodology was to share his life. He did not tell the disciples to cast out devils. He showed them first how to cast out devils. He did not tell them to heal the sick. He showed them first to heal the sick. He did not tell them that God will provide. He showed them first the provision of God by taking coins out of the fish's mouth. You see, discipleship is about sharing life. It's easy to say to someone what to do. But it is a different thing, Tanya, to show them how to do it. You see, this is the problem in the kingdom. Or I should say in the church of God. You have many people that want to tell people what to do, but they are not prepared to show the people how to do it. You want to tell me how to raise my son, but you don't want to show me how you raise your son. You want to tell me how to love my wife, but you don't want to show me how you love your wife. You want to tell me how to raise my children, but you don't want to show me how you raise your children. You want to tell me how to sow a seed in the kingdom of God, but you don't want to show me how you sow a seed. You want to tell me that I must stop smoking and drinking, but you don't want to show me how you stop smoking and drinking. You want to tell me how to stop fornicating and how to stop being an adulterer, but you don't want to show me how to do it. You see, Christ did not tell them, Christ showed them. And this is the power of a shared life. That discipleship is not a call to tell someone. Discipleship is a call to show someone. This is what Christ meant in the Great Commission when he said to the disciples that they must teach the people to observe all things which he has commanded them. He was trying to remind the disciples that when others can't remember, remind them that I only live for the will of the Father and I showed you the Father. You see, discipleship in its purest and most simplest form is to share your life with someone. Not to do life. There's a difference between sharing life and doing life. You, you, you can do life but not share life. Oh, we, we, we do life, we're just going to go for sushi. Let's do life together, man. Oh, we do life, let's go away on a holiday together. That doesn't mean we're sharing life. Because the life comes from the word. And so many people, they, they, they do life together. But they don't share life. Because the minute you correct them, they leave you. The minute there's a disagreement in the relationship, they leave. You're only doing life, man. You're not sharing life. Uh, just, just think about this for a minute. Here comes Christ. He says to his disciples, I am dying. Tomorrow I'm going to die on the cross. Here comes Peter. And Peter calls him one side and says to him, Hey, Jesus, you don't ever see that again. I don't ever want to hear you say that again. You hear me? You don't ever say that again. Jesus looks at him and says, Get behind me, Satan. You have no will part in God's will. He rebukes Peter. So they have a disagreement, Tanya. Yes. Does Peter run away? He doesn't run away. He accepts the rebuke. Why? Because they shared life. They weren't doing life. They weren't doing life. They shared life. 
They shared their weaknesses. They shared their strengths. The reason why Christ can rebuke him because Christ knows the way the temper net is me. Christ knows yeah, the brat Peter he rak irritated net is me. Ek ek brat no one me siaw rak. Christ knows this guy Peter. Sometimes he doesn't work well with people just like me, and so he rebukes him. The spirit, not the person. And you see, the point of discipleship is not for us to do life. It's to share life. I, I, my bugbear. People say, hey, it's such an honor to do life with you. Ah, well, maybe for you. But I'd rather you share your life with me. Because you see, when you share your life with me, Uncle Alwyn, you share it in every season that you are in. You see, when we do life in certain seasons, then you don't want to do your life with me because you're in a bad season. Then you cut me out. Then you don't want me to come close. You don't pick up my call. You don't respond to my messages. When I come to your house and I knock on the door, Dr. God, I was in the upmarki. Because you don't want to do life with me in that space. But when you share your life with me, you share everything about yourself with me because you understand the power of a covenant relationship. I will just talk about covenant relationships. I said, Ik maar ik meer bepaal hier bij mijn notas. En maar helping someone this morning. Yes. And so I said all of that to you. I was my introduction. <laughs> I was my introduction. Can I can I preach this morning? Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. I'm so glad to be here this morning. Come on, you enjoyed the praise and worship this morning. Amen. You enjoyed that offering this morning. Can we preach this morning? Wow, brothers and sisters, this morning I want to speak to you. I get eight minutes away. I get nog eens begin. I said twenty two minutes past ten. Or was it two minutes past ten? They asked me to finish at half past ten. Um, let me help you. Let me help you. And so. What I want you to understand, I read for you Luke chapter number 9, verse 1 and 2. And I showed you that Christ said that he gave his disciples all authority over all devils and to cure all diseases. When you read the word disease, read the word dis-ease. So in other words, every problem. So in other words, when you come into the kingdom of God and you become born again, you must then fundamentally as a first principle, Nico, understand that there is something of God on your life. Each and every single one of us. As a first principle of discipleship, I want you to understand that there is something of God, Mandy, on your life. You see, when Christ sent his disciples to gain witness and to, or, or to find new disciples, he did not send them powerless. He said to them, I give you power and authority over the works of the devil. And in the same way, you and I are not powerless. You and I are not without help. There's something of God on your life. It might not look like it. It might not feel like it. You might not even think it. But the truth of the word of God is that there is something of God on your life. Some people refer to it as an anointing. Some people refer to it as a grace. Some people refer to it as a gift. Some people refer to it as an enablement. It does not matter what you call it. The point is there's something of God on your life. And because there's something of God on your life, it means you have something to give to someone. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what stage in life you find yourself, you have something to give. You have an anointing, you have an enablement, you have a grace, you have a gift. There's something that you have to give. And so I don't want you to feel insecure. I don't want you to feel uh, unassured about yourself and say, Pastor, how can I disciple someone? How can I share my life with someone? No, you can because God is with you and there's something of God on your life. You must understand that it is this thing, the God thing, that is on you, that is in you, that gives you the ability to walk in purpose, that gives you the ability 
to walk in your destiny. Every single one of us, as we are sit seated here, and, and those abilities are informed by our life experiences. Everything that you have experienced up until now has prepared you for this very moment in time. Has prepared you to disciple. So if you are a, a, a divorced and now you are single and you've gone through your time of mourning the loss of your husband or of your wife and you've come through it and you are now whole, you have a grace to walk with someone that's going through that same experience. If you want to know what God has called you to, just look at what he has called you out of. Can I say that again? If you want to know what God has called, I'm going to say it in a better way. If you want to know what God has called you to, just have a look at what he has called you from. Some of you he called from addiction. He called you from lying. He called you from stealing. He called you from dark places. Pulled you up out of the mighty clay. Set your feet upon a solid rock. Shaped you, mold you. Now look at you. And now when people look at you, you can say, it is the Lord's doing. I don't know how I would have made it. I should have lost my mind. I should have died. I, I, sh I should have been dead. I should have, I should have been living on the streets. I would long say, Say if I'm going to stop it, was it for the irony? And so, whatever God has called you from, you have a grace to go and minister to. You have a grace to go and disciple in. And so, what is required now is that you share your life. You have something that is worth sharing. I want you to recognize that. I don't want you another day to walk out of this place thinking that you have nothing to give. And that's why I can't disciple pastor. Vs. Ekmano. We, we must stop. Listen, can I say this, man? We must stop thinking so small of ourselves. You know, the Bible says that you are a God. Little God, big God. The point is, the Bible says you are a God. Oh, you have to demean so much snacks. Do Psalm, Psalm chapter number eight. Just, just for reference point, Psalm chapter number eight. Psalm chapter number eight. <laughs> now, just think about this. If you were created a little bit lower than the angels, why would you want to think small of yourself? Why would you have this mentality of woe is me? Think bigger, man. Think, think big things. You serve a big God. I mean, some of you call to do business, but they will business doing for an moon. What's wrong with you? Why, why do you only want to survive? Why can't you thrive? When you man praat met my ogen. But this is the power of a shared life. That when you can take your total experiences. And so someone else the way through your loved experiences. This is what discipleship is about. I got to get into this thing. And so I want you to understand that there's something that's on your life. But number two, what you must understand, what's on you is not for everyone. I, I am not for everyone. Listen, I know some people, I, I'm definitely not for everyone. AP, AP, I can tell you now, as I know my name, I'm not for everyone. I irritate some people. I know and I like it. I say, I don't irritate you, I'll irritate you. But that's just my personality. I, I frustrate some people. And it's okay. And it's okay, I mean, because I know who I am. And I know I'm not for everyone. But I am for someone. And so Christ put it this way in John chapter number 17. He doesn't pray for the world. He says, Father, I only pray for those that you have given me out of the world. So in terms of discipleship, you don't want to disciple the whole world. Just pray, Lord, let me share my life with those whom you have given me out of the world. 
they, Christ puts it this way. He says, they were yours, but you gave them to me. Now I pray for them. And so we're so concerned about everybody. But there's that one body that is your somebody. But instead, now you're sitting with nobody. There's one body that's your somebody. But because you're concerned about everybody, you're sitting with nobody. I said Facebook status. And so when we talk sharing life, we don't want to share our life with the whole world. You must, you must think about it in this way. There's my circle of concern. And there's my circle of influence. I am concerned about global warming. Global warming. 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 I am concerned about global warming. But I can't do anything about global warming on a global scale. It's my circle of concern. But in my circle of influence, I can use less plastic in my house. Circle of influence, circle of concern. We are so concerned about all things that we have no influence on. And so we don't share our life. Because we're worried about our concerns instead of focusing on where we have influence. Just stick to where you have influence. Am I helping someone? You, you, you must know that you are not for everyone. Come on, someone shout, I am not for everyone. What is on you is not for everyone, but it is for someone. So don't stop worrying about everyone that causing you to sit with no one. Just focus on the someone that God has given you. Amen? You have to share your life with with. with would someone, uh, 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 can somebody just check for me if Pastor Didim are ready, if I can continue, it's half past ten. Uncle Don, thank you so much. I'm going to continue in the meantime. I mean, I like to six by break this thing down a bit. So, so let me help you this morning. Here's some keys to living a shared life because it's going to cost you something. Number one, uh, the, the key to living a shared life, number one, first and foremost, is a willingness to lay down your own life for the cause of the Father. To which he has called you. I read to you in the scripture in Luke chapter 9. You must understand that it is only when you lay down your life. That you will find your life. So many people say to me. Pastor I first want to find myself. Before I can do X, Y, Z. But the kingdom of God doesn't work that way. If you want to find yourself Uncle Zephyr. You must lose yourself. If you want to live you must first die. So many of us wants to live, but no one wants to die. And so the first principle to living a shared life is that you must be willing to die. You must be willing to lose your own life, your own dreams, your own desires, your own ambitions. You must let go of all of that. And when you let go of all of that, you will find the life that God has for you. You see, this is why Christ says the following. He says, remember I said to you, Christ is the model, Right? So I must point you towards Christ, not so that you can grow closer to Christ, but so that you can grow closer to the Father, but the model is Christ. So Christ puts it this way, he said, no one takes my life. Christ said, no one takes my life. He says, I give my life. And so in the same way, God does not want to take your life. And so God will never bring you to a place where you can share your life with others meaningfully until you have given your life to him. Now I'm not talking about getting born again because that's the easy part. Because you see living a shared life is a, is a difficult life. You see living for the will of the father and following the model of Christ requires commitment. It requires a daily conscientious decision that you will not give in to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It requires a daily commitment that in spite of how difficult the walk can get, and it will get difficult, that you will keep on sharing your life. And sometimes when sharing your life, those whom you share your life with will bite you. Ask me, I know, ask my wife. They will bite you. And you will cry on one another's bosom, Dr. Goff. And you will say, yeah, but I gave, they will still bite you and it will hurt. And it will be painful. And then you have to pull yourself towards yourself. 
Because only iron sharpens iron. They can't even amal prati. And then you got to do it again tomorrow. Because you see, Christ says, no one takes my life. I give it. Number two, you must understand that you owe nothing in this world. And you take nothing with it. This must be your mentality. If you're going to live in the power of a shared life, you must understand that you owe nothing and you take nothing. Christ said it in the following way. He said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. It was not that he did not have a house, banker, because he might believe He had brothers and sisters. He was from the town of Nazareth. He had a house. What he was trying to say to us is that I am not going to hold on to material things at the expense of living in the will of the Father by sharing my life. And you see, you must understand that the only thing you take with you to heaven is the impact that you have made in the lives of people. That's the only thing you take to heaven. You can't even be my same heaven to fatty. I can't even savings accounts I'm heaven to fatty. I can't take my degrees with me to heaven. I can't, I can't take my kids with me to heaven. When I go, I go alone. Can't take my wife with me to heaven. So I like so far so I make the fact so that the other man was no need. Can benefit one. You know? <laughs> you know? So I can not say my son can, amen? And so living in the power of a shared, yes sir, five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen, who feel? Five. Amen, let me rest. You, you must understand, your mentality must be, I owe nothing. When you owe nothing, it becomes easier to share. When you don't own it, it becomes easier to share. Because you see, when, when you don't own it, you don't think about how hard you worked for it. <laughs> but when you own it, and you think about how you hard you worked for it, what's it also means it was hard to share. You had to let someone else to me, I had to wait, I had to sweet up. So you see, when if you're going to share your life, you must understand that you own nothing. And so because you don't own it, you can share it. You don't own your life. If you're born again, if you're a son in the kingdom of God, you don't own your life. My life is not my own. Do you? Nee, But do you mean it? Do you mean it? That your life is not your own? Number three. If you are going to live in the power of a shared life, you have to be willing to pay the price. Because you see, there's a cost in sharing your life with people. From of a begin it the experience. It will cost you a toilet seat. You have to six months with your toilet seat replace. I don't know, you guys don't know what I'm talking about here. I can see a man with a toilet seat replaced. I can see a man with a never said copy scope. Because he copies brick. Your car, your car is a leer, blij veel. It's your kennis. It's your kennis. It's your kennis. Come on, talk to me this morning. Never have time for yourself. Always spending your time and your life with someone else. Medicine, you don't want to open up. Have you noticed people that do nothing always have something to say to people that are doing something? You don't want to open up. Pisa kasi yung yung play pisa. You guys must rest now. No, we 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 in the will of the Father. Get into the will of the Father. Share your life. It will cost you something. And this is what Christ says. Anyone that wants to follow me, you must count the cost and you must pick up his cross daily. You see, sharing your life is a daily decision that you have to make conscientiously every day when you wake up. 
that I'm going to share my life. Now let me give you four parts to come. And I'll see it five minutes over. So I'm not going to go into detail. Let me give you some benefits. Some benefits that God will bring to you when you share your life. Number one, your strengths and your weaknesses will allow others to see that they too can be used by God. This is for me the biggest thing. Because you see, sometimes when people look at us here on the pulpit, they don't see our weaknesses. You see me standing here? This is the anointing. Listen, this is not me. This is not natural. Some of the stuff I say here, I also hear it for the first time, in case you didn't know. Because this is an anointing. This is a grace. And so sometimes I say it, I say it, I think it's when it clings so quiet. I just want to say it again so I can remind myself of it because it's the first time I'm also hearing it. Because this is an anointing. This is not real life. This is not real life. This is grace. Real life was as if a marak kreeberi is the way like United in Crystal Palace game kick. And I screamed in my TV. And I got my TV stuck in the That's real life. Real life is when you find me this afternoon sitting at the table and eating with my family. Real life is when you accompany me to the office and see how I interact with my staff. How I treat my staff. How, real life is when you see me in my, in my area of influence and see how I treat people. And you see, if I don't share my life with you, you will never see that. And if you never see that, you think that God can't use you. Because you only see me here in my strength, in my grace, in my anointing. But when you begin to share your life with other people, Virgil, and then you see, nah, die broer praat aan stik in die Engels, man. Maar met sy stik in die Engels gebruik die Heere vir hom. As die Heere vir hom met stik in die Engels gebruik, ek kan die Heere vir my ook met stik in die Engels gebruik. This is the power of a shared life. Hoe jy het, hier kom die paste, hier kom die paste. Hier kom die paste. I was going to mention it to you, then I'm going to stop, amen. Number two, you get to impact not just an individual, but you will impact families. Because you see, when you share your life with someone, pretty soon you're in their house. You access to the mother, access to the father, access to the brother. They invite you to a family function. Oh, access to the cousins. Pretty soon you see the mother, the father, the uncle, the nephew, the niece, the auntie, the uncle. They all in church. Why? Because you shared your life. This is the power of a shared life. Number three, you are building fruit that will speak for you in heaven. That's the only thing you can take with you. Fruit that will speak for you in heaven. Number four, you obtain the approval of God. I don't have time to explain. But you obtain the approval of God. Because you see, it is God's methodology that the Christ walk, that discipleship is lived in relationship. And God approves of that. So you want to get the approval of God? So share your life with people. Must what I must just say this man. I said to them, if they're going to share their life with people, it will cost them something. I just want to ask you, how many toilet seats you replaced in your lifetime? How many toilet seats? She's still repairing. How many cups? I tell you a story. So Pastor Tim just got married. We're about 17 years old and I'm stopping. We're about 17 years old. Pa Is Ashley Isa? So, so I see Isa and Ex in So we're all sitting there in the house, and in the bathroom is wedding gifts, man, Uncle Don. But it's these beautiful candles, man. But no, always it must be like of y'all in Menembak, always can you find the case and always think it's ornaments, you know. But it's the fragrant, beautiful wedding gifts, candles. From Pastor Peter's name and to Pastor D and to Pastor C. Tahat brick bearded case. Any man say for any money. So at some point in the evening, my steward goes into the bathroom and he sees a this stick in the case. The case is mooi terug is <laughs> Hey, meeting! Meeting! Can you picture in past the D's house? He's just got married. He just got married. He's supposed to be on honeymoon, but there's about 30 young people on a Friday night in his living room. This is sharing your life. And he's not going to sleep with him. 
Op die koutjes, hij wat koutjes was om maar oog getrek, want hij wat het al het vannacht besef, wat koutjes kan je werk met die jongens, hulle voeten is veel. Family meeting. You guys must now know, this is not Donnie's house, he is now a married man, this is our, you must respect me. Oos wel nou die respect jou boundaries van, dan nou wanne af al die. But did they stop? No, because it will cost you something. And the last one, which is the most important one for me, and I'm stopping. When you share your life with someone, you break generational curses and destroy patterns of oppression. And I share a testimony with you. I was 16 turning 17 when Pastor D met me. And my biggest desire in life at that point in time was to go to prison and get a 26 tattoo just here. And um, everybody in my family, and my mom is here, she will tell you if I'm lying. Everybody in my family is gangsters. And I was on that same path. No one in my family finished matric. No one in my family went to university. No one in my family had a driver's license. No one in my family had their own house. No one in my family only had children once they were married. Everybody was born out of wedlock. I was also born out of wedlock. And when I met this man... And he began to disciple me. And he began to share his life with me. The power of a shared life began to work in my life. And what was now a generational curse in my family, all of those things that I told you about, because it went on from generation to generation to generation. When I got discipled by someone who was following the model of Jesus, but pointing towards the Father, all of those curses stop now you see sometimes the curse can stop but the oppression stays and this is sometimes many of us the curse stops but the oppression is still there and you require someone that will come alongside you and walk you through things because now there's some things on the inside emotional things soulless things that is causing this oppression that will help you on this journey to work those things out and here I stand today, got a beautiful wife, three beautiful children, beautiful family, sharing our lives with other people. Every generational curse broken. Every generational oppression broken. Master's degrees. What is the lowest level for my children from an educational perspective at the moment? A master's degree. What was our lowest level? Grade 10. I failed grade 10. It was the plan of the enemy. And you see this, brothers and sisters, is what discipleship is about. It is about you being willing to share your total life with someone. And when you do that, God will find you. And God will honor you. And God will advance you. And God will promote you. And God will increase you. Why? Because now you are in the will of God. Amen.